The whisper shouldn't have been possible, not from inside a closed coffin. Yet there it was again, faint but unmistakable, cutting through the funeral home's artificial silence. I stood frozen, my hand clutching the rosary I'd brought to place with my granddaughter. Grammy, help. My heart stopped. That voice, Ivy's voice. I'd know it anywhere, having heard it countless times asking for bedtime stories or extra cookies. But Ivy was supposed to be dead. That's what Jasper and Delilah had told me three days ago, their faces painted with grief, I now questioned. The whisper came again, weaker this time. I lurched forward, my arthritic fingers fumbling with the coffin's latches. They'd chosen a beautiful white casket for my four-year-old granddaughter, with gold trim and pink silk lining. The kind of thing you'd expect from Delilah, always so concerned with appearances. The lid resisted at first, then gave way with a soft creak. I gasped. Ivy lay there, bound in her favorite purple dress, her small chest rising and falling with shallow breaths. Her eyes fluttered open, glazed but alive. Grammy, she whispered again, reaching for me with trembling fingers. My hands shook as I lifted her out, cradling her like I had when she was an infant. She felt lighter than I remembered, frilier. The funeral home's dim lighting revealed dark circles under her eyes and dried tears on her cheeks. What did they do to you, sweetheart? I asked, my voice barely steady. Mommy said I had to be quiet. She said it was a game. Ivy's words slurred slightly, but I didn't like it. It was dark and scary. The front door chimed. Footsteps echoed through the building, the funeral director returning from his lunch break. I grabbed my coat from the chair and wrapped it around Ivy, my mind racing. We couldn't stay here. Mrs. Everhart, the director's voice carried down the hallway. Is everything all right in there? I held Ivy closer feeling her small heart beating against my chest. We're fine, I called back, surprising myself with how calm I sounded. Just saying goodbye. Take all the time you need. Ivy's fingers clutched my blouse. Grammy, I'm scared. Don't be, baby. Grammy's got you now. I kissed her forehead, tasting the powder they'd used to make her look dead for the viewing. My son and his wife had planned to bury their own daughter alive. The thought made my stomach turn. My phone buzzed, a text from Jasper. Mom, where are you? The service starts in an hour. I didn't reply. Instead, I moved toward the room's side exit, grateful I'd insisted on this private viewing time. My car waited in the back lot, and I had maybe minutes before someone came looking. We're going on a little trip, I told Ivy, trying to keep my voice steady. But first, I need you to tell me everything. Everything about this game mommy and daddy made you play. Ivy's next words chilled me to the bone. They said the new baby needed more room. That heaven would be better for me. She paused, her small body trembling. But I heard them talking about the insurance money too. The pieces clicked into place. Delilah's difficult pregnancy with their son. The recent financial troubles Jasper thought he'd hidden from me. The rushed funeral arrangements. My own flesh and blood had tried to murder their daughter for money. I started the car, my mind already mapping out our next moves. They'd chosen this funeral home for its reputation of discretion. Now that same privacy would buy us the time we needed to disappear. Rest now, sweetheart, I whispered to Ivy as she drifted off in the back seat. Grammy's going to make everything right, and God help anyone who try to stop me. The motel room's flickering light cast shadows across Ivy's sleeping face as my phone buzzed for the 20th time. Jasper's name flashed on the screen again. I silenced it, remembering the last conversation we'd had three weeks ago before all this madness started. Mom, you need to stop hovering, he'd said, standing in his marble kitchen, adjusting his tie with manicured fingers. Ivy's fine. Kids get quiet sometimes. She's not eating, Jasper. She flinches when Delilah comes near her. I'd reached for his arm, but he'd stepped away like my touch might wrinkle his perfectly pressed suit. You're imagining things. Delilah's an excellent mother. The memory made my hands shake as I checked Ivy's temperature. The drug they'd given her was wearing off, but she still felt too warm. I'd need to risk getting her to a doctor soon, one who wouldn't ask too many questions. 
My phone lit up again, this time with a text from Delilah. Please, Viola. We're worried sick. Just tell us where you are. I almost laughed. Worried sick? After what they'd done, a knock at the door made me freeze. Through the thin walls, I heard a familiar voice. Vi? It's Miriam. Let me in. I hesitated, then checked the peephole. Miriam Blake stood there alone, her silver hair disheveled, holding a paper bag from the pharmacy. How did you find us? I asked through the crack in the door. You really think I wouldn't recognize your car at the Blue Pine Motel? I've known you 30 years. She pushed past me, setting the bag down. The whole town's looking for you, too. There's talk of kidnapping charges. Kidnapping? My voice cracked. They tried to bury her alive, Miriam. I believe you. She glanced at Ivy, her expression softening. But you need a plan. Jasper's got the police convinced you had some kind of breakdown after Robert died. My late husband's name hit like a punch to the gut. He's using his father's death against me? He's using everything he can. Says you've been unstable, imagining conspiracies. Miriam pulled out children's Tylenol and fresh clothes from her bag. Delilah's playing the devastated mother perfectly. You should see her performance at the hospital with the new baby. The baby. In all this chaos, I'd almost forgotten about my newborn grandson. How is he? Healthy. They named him Finn. Miriam paused. Vi, they're painting you as the villain. You need proof of what they did. Ivy stirred, whimpering in her sleep. I smoothed her hair, noting the slight bruise on her temple where they must have struck her. Would pictures be enough? Maybe. But you'll need more. Miriam's eyes narrowed. What about the funeral home? There must be paperwork, something showing they knew she was alive. The director seemed clueless. But I remembered something. Delilah insisted on handling all the arrangements herself. Said she had a special understanding with them. That's worth looking into. Miriam checked her watch. I should go before someone notices my car. But why? She gripped my hand. Whatever you do, don't trust anyone else. Not even people who seem sympathetic. Money talks in this town, and Jasper's got plenty of it. After she left, I sat watching Ivy sleep, my mind racing. The bruise on her temple told one story, but we'd need more. Something concrete that would force Jasper and Delilah to face justice. My phone buzzed one final time. A text from an unknown number. Mrs. Everhart, this is Thomas from Peaceful Rest Funeral Home. There's something you should know about your son's payment arrangements. Please call when you can. I stared at the message, hope and dread mixing in my chest. Whatever Thomas knew might be the key to saving Ivy, or the trap that would destroy us both. Thomas from the funeral home met me behind the quick mart at midnight, his hands shaking as he passed me a manila envelope. Mrs. Everhart, after you left with Ivy, they came looking for these. He glanced over his shoulder. Your son offered me money to destroy them. Inside the envelope, I found forms with Delilah's elegant signature, dated weeks before Ivy's death. Prearrangements, payment schedules, and something that made my blood freeze, a medical waiver declining standard embalming procedures. They knew she'd be alive, I whispered. There's more. Thomas pulled out his phone, showing me security footage. Delilah entering the funeral home three days before the service, carrying a small medical bag. She said it was makeup for the viewing, but the sedatives. Of course. My phone buzzed, Jasper calling again. This time, I answered. Where's my daughter? His voice was steel wrapped in silk. Which one? The one you tried to bury alive, or the one you're pretending to grieve for? A pause. Mom, you're not well. We can get you help. I have the funeral home documents, Jasper. And the security footage. The silk disappeared. If you go public with this, you'll destroy everything. The business, our reputation. You tried to murder my granddaughter. It wasn't like that. His voice cracked slightly. We were desperate. The company's failing. The new baby's medical bills. Delilah's father threatened to cut her off unless we produced a male heir. The insurance money would have solved everything. I thought of Robert, how proud he'd been of our son. Your father would be ashamed. Don't you dare bring him into this. 
Jasper's composure slipped further. You have no idea what it's like trying to keep everything together. Delilah's family, the social obligations, the expectations. So, you decided Ivy was expendable? Another pause. Where are you? Somewhere safe. And I'm going to make sure everyone knows what you did. Think carefully, Mom. His voice turned cold again. Who will believe you? The grieving grandmother, traumatized by her husband's death, kidnapping her supposedly dead granddaughter? I have friends in the police department, in the DA's office. Delilah's father owns half the judges in the state. Behind me, Thomas cleared his throat. Mrs. Everhart, there's something else you should see. He handed me another document, a life insurance policy on Ivy, taken out just months after her birth. The beneficiary wasn't Jasper or Delilah. It was their unborn son. They planned this from the beginning. I said, my hands trembling. From the moment they knew they were having a boy. My phone buzzed again, a text from Miriam. Police at your house. They're calling it a kidnapping. Get out now. I have to go, I told Thomas. Will you testify if it comes to that? He nodded slowly. My daughter's Ivy's age. I couldn't live with myself if I didn't. As I drove away, another text came through, this time from Delilah. We can fix this, Viola. Come home. Bring Ivy. We'll say it was all a misunderstanding. I deleted it without responding. They'd underestimated me, thought I'd be too weak, too proper to fight back. But they'd forgotten something crucial. A grandmother's love is fiercer than any social obligation or financial pressure. In the rearview mirror, I saw police lights in the distance. They were coming, but I had what I needed now. Evidence, an ally, and most importantly, the truth about how long they'd been planning this. Ivy stirred in the back seat. Grammy, where are we going? Somewhere safe, sweetheart. And this time, we're going to make sure everyone knows exactly what mommy and daddy did. The truth would come out, even if it burned our family's perfect facade to the ground. Miriam's cabin sat deep in the woods, far from cell service and prying eyes. As I helped Ivy settle into the spare bedroom, my friend's expression darkened. The police searched my house this morning, she said, closing the bedroom door. Delilah's father was with them. That man gives me chills. Maxwell Monroe. The name tasted bitter. What did they want? To remind me that helping fugitives is a federal crime. Miriam's hands trembled as she poured coffee. Vi, there's something else. They're saying Robert's death wasn't an accident. The mug slipped from my grip, shattering on the floor. My husband's car accident had happened six months ago, just after he'd discovered discrepancies in Jasper's company accounts. They're suggesting I killed Robert and kidnapped Ivy because I'm unstable. The pieces clicked together with horrifying clarity. They're trying to discredit me before I can expose them. A small voice came from the bedroom. Grammy, I'm thirsty. I started to move, but Miriam caught my arm. There's a detective asking questions about Robert's break lines. They're building a case against you. Through the bedroom door, I could hear Ivy humming the lullaby I used to sing her. The same one I'd sung to Jasper as a baby. They won't stop until they destroy us both. Then destroy them first. Miriam pulled out her laptop. Remember that notebook you mentioned? The one with their plans? It's in Jasper's study. But the police. Are watching your house, yes. But not mine. She smiled grimly. And they don't know about Thomas from the funeral home. Or the security footage. A knock at the front door made us freeze. Through the window, I glimpsed a familiar car. Maxwell Monroe's silver Bentley. Back door, Miriam whispered. My car's ready. Take Ivy and... The door burst open. Maxwell stood there, his expensive suit immaculate, two police officers behind him. Viola. His smile never reached his eyes. You've caused quite a mess. How did you find us? He gestured to Miriam, who wouldn't meet my gaze. Everyone has a price. Even old friends. My heart stopped. Miriam. I'm sorry, Vi. Tears streaked her face. They threatened my grandson's custody case. I had no choice. Maxwell stepped closer. Where are the funeral home documents? Safe. I backed toward Ivy's room. Like the evidence about Robert's break lines? 
His smile faltered slightly. Careful, Viola. Grief can make people imagine terrible things. Grammy? Ivy appeared in the doorway, clutching her stuffed rabbit. I don't feel good. The room spun as I noticed the empty medicine cup by Miriam's coffee pot. What did you give her? Just something to help her sleep, Miriam whispered. They promised they wouldn't hurt her. I caught Ivy as she stumbled, her small body burning with fever. Maxwell watched with cold calculation. You can't fight this, Viola. The police, the courts, they'll believe what we tell them. But there's another way. He pulled out his phone. Sign custody of both children over to Jasper and Delilah. Admit to your breakdown. We'll ensure you get treatment instead of prison. Ivy grew heavier in my arms, her breathing shallow. Whatever they'd given her was more than a sleeping pill. She needs a doctor, I pleaded. Sign the papers first. In that moment, I saw what I'd been missing. This wasn't just about money or social standing. This was about power, the power to break people, to make them bend. I thought of Robert, of his final phone call about the company's books, of Jasper's desperate ambition and Delilah's perfect facade. I'll sign, I said, watching Maxwell's triumphant smile. But first, let me tell you about the evidence I mailed to the FBI this morning. The smile vanished. Behind him, one of the officers shifted uncomfortably, and I realized the game wasn't over yet. It was just beginning. The emergency room's fluorescent lights cast harsh shadows as doctors worked on Ivy. I sat in the waiting room, Maxwell's words echoing in my head, the FBI won't find anything, but they might find Robert's real killer. Officer Sarachin approached, her badge glinting. She'd been one of the officers at Miriam's cabin, but something in her expression had changed. Mrs. Everhart. She sat beside me, keeping her voice low. I pulled the brake line report from your husband's accident. The cut was professional, not random. I gripped the armrest. Why are you telling me this? Because Maxwell Monroe made three calls to a burner phone the day before Mr. Everhart died. She glanced around. And because my sister lost custody of her kids to her wealthy ex-husband last year. Money talks in this town, but sometimes it says too much. The treatment room door opened. The doctor approached, his face grave. The sedative was mixed with something else. We're still running tests, but... My phone buzzed, Jasper. How's my daughter? I stepped away to answer. You mean the one you tried to kill, or the one you're poisoning now? Mom, stop being dramatic. Ivy just had a bad reaction to some medicine. His voice wavered slightly. Sign the custody papers. Let us fix this. Like you fixed Robert's break lines? A long pause. Dad's death was an accident. Was it? Or did he find something in those company books? You don't understand what's at stake. Jasper's composure cracked. Delilah's father. He owns everything. The company, the house, our future. We just needed to give him what he wanted. A grandson instead of a granddaughter? Mom, please. He's watching the hospital. If you don't sign those papers. The line went dead. Officer Chin appeared beside me, her expression urgent. Mrs. Everhart, Maxwell just entered the building. And he's not alone. Through the emergency room windows, I saw Delilah getting out of a car, cradling baby Finn. Her perfect makeup couldn't hide her red-rimmed eyes. Your daughter-in-law looks scared, Chin observed. She should be. I watched Delilah hurry inside. She just had a baby, and her father's willing to poison a four-year-old. Mrs. Everhart. The doctor returned. Ivy's asking for you. And... He hesitated. She's saying something about a notebook under Daddy's desk. Suddenly, Delilah's fear made sense. The notebook I'd mentioned to Maxwell, the one I hadn't actually sent to the FBI, must still be in Jasper's study. And it contained more than just their plans for Ivy. Officer Chun, I need a favor. I pulled out my phone, showing her Thomas's security footage. Get this to someone we can trust and keep Maxwell away from Ivy's room for 10 minutes. She nodded, understanding. What about your daughter-in-law? I watched Delilah pacing near the entrance, clutching Finn like a shield. Send her to me. It's time she chose between her father and her children. The hospital intercom crackled. Code blue, P. 
pediatric emergency. Medical staff rushed past as Chen slipped away, leaving me alone with my decision. In Ivy's room, monitors beeped steadily. She looked so small in the hospital bed, her favorite rabbit clutched tight. On the chair beside her lay Delilah's designer handbag, forgotten in her rush to get help. Inside, I found her phone unlocked. On the screen, a draft email to the FBI sat unsent, detailing everything, Robert's murder, the insurance fraud, Maxwell's corporate crimes. Footsteps approached. I had seconds to decide, delete the evidence of Delilah's almost betrayal, or use it to drive the final wedge between father and daughter. The door opened. Delilah entered Ivy's hospital room alone, Finn cradled against her chest. Her mascara had run, leaving dark trails down her cheeks. They're going to kill her, aren't they? I held up her phone with the unsent FBI email. Like they killed Robert? She sank into the chair, trembling. I didn't know about Robert. Not until after. But Ivy. Her voice cracked. Daddy said it would be peaceful. That she wouldn't feel anything. And you believed him? I believed I didn't have a choice. She looked down at Finn. He owns everything. The house, the company, our future. When the prenatal test showed a boy. She stopped, choking back tears. The monitors tracking Ivy's vitals beeped steadily. Through the window, I saw Maxwell talking to hospital security, showing them papers, probably a court order. Your father's coming for both children, I said. Are you going to let him? Delilah's fingers tightened around Finn. He'll destroy us if I don't. He's already destroying you. I moved closer to Ivy's bed. Look at your daughter, Delilah. Really look at her. Ivy stirred, her small hand reaching out. Mommy. Something broke in Delilah's expression. She stood, about to step forward, when the door burst open. Maxwell entered, flanked by security and a woman in a suit. Child Protective Services, the woman announced. We have an emergency custody order for both children. Maxwell's smile was razor sharp. It's over, Viola. The judge agreed you're unstable, a danger to these children. No. Delilah clutched Finn tighter. Daddy, you promise. Quiet, dear. His tone could freeze hell. The orderlies will help you hand over the baby. Officer Chin appeared in the doorway, but Maxwell held up a restraining order. The police have no jurisdiction here. This is a family court matter. I watched helplessly as security approached Ivy's bed. All our evidence, all our plans, none of it mattered against Maxwell's power and money. Then Ivy spoke, her voice surprisingly clear. Mommy, tell them about the special book. Maxwell froze. Delilah's eyes widened. The one under daddy's desk, Ivy continued, with all the numbers and names. I saw the flash of fear cross Maxwell's face. The notebook, not just evidence of their plan for Ivy, but apparently something much bigger. Delilah, Maxwell warned, remember what's at stake. She looked at Ivy, then at Finn, then at her father. Years of manipulation and control played across her face. Mrs. Monroe, the CPS worker stepped forward. Please hand over the baby. Delilah stood, walking toward her father. For a moment, I thought she'd surrendered. Then she turned to Officer Chin. I want to make a statement, she said, her voice shaking but firm, about Robert Everhart's murder, about the notebook, about everything. Maxwell lunged for her, but security grabbed him instead of us. In the chaos, I saw his mask finally crack, revealing the monster beneath. You ungrateful little, he stopped, composing himself. Fine, tell them. But remember, that notebook implicates Jasper too. Are you ready to send your husband to prison? The room fell silent except for the steady beep of Ivy's monitors. Delilah looked at me, tears streaming down her face. I'm sorry, she whispered. And then she handed Finn to Maxwell. The CPS worker moved toward Ivy's bed as Delilah fled the room, her sobs echoing down the hall. Maxwell's triumph was complete. I had failed. Failed Robert. Failed Ivy. Failed everyone. As they prepare to take my grandchildren, I realized this wasn't about justice anymore. It wasn't even about revenge. It was about survival. 
And sometimes, to survive, you have to be willing to burn everything down. I reached for my phone, my fingers hovering over a number I'd sworn never to call, Robert's brother. The FBI agent we'd cut ties with years ago over a family feud. Sometimes the devil you know is better than the one wearing your father-in-law's face. FBI agent Marcus Everhart arrived as Maxwell was loading Finn into his car. My brother-in-law hadn't aged well. Grief had carved deep lines around his eyes since Robert's funeral. That's far enough, Monroe. Marcus's badge glinted in the hospital parking lot lights. We have a warrant for those financial records your granddaughter mentioned. Maxwell's smile didn't waver. Agent Everhart, still bitter about losing the family fortune to your younger brother. Actually, Marcus pulled out his phone. I'm bitter about this. He played an audio file, Jasper's voice trembling. Dad found the offshore accounts. Maxwell said he'd handle it. The baby carrier slipped from Maxwell's grip. Officer Chin caught it before it hit the ground, whisking Finn to safety. Where did you get that? Maxwell's composure cracked. From me. Jasper emerged from the shadows, looking older than his years. I recorded everything after Dad died. I just couldn't face what I'd done. I stepped forward. You knew? All this time. I thought I could protect them another way. Jasper wouldn't meet my eyes. Keep playing along until I had enough evidence. But when Delilah suggested the insurance plan for Ivy, you let them try to murder your daughter. I didn't know they'd actually do it. His voice broke. I thought if I stalled long enough, but then I heard Ivy crying in the coffin. Maxwell lunged for his car, but Marcus was faster. As they grappled, something fell from Maxwell's jacket, a syringe, identical to the one that had poisoned Ivy. Evidence, Officer Chin said, bagging it. Plus the notebook your wife just delivered to the station, Mr. Everhart. Quite detailed about both the murder and the financial fraud. Delilah appeared in the hospital doorway, holding Ivy's hand. Our eyes met across the parking lot. No words needed. She'd chosen her children over her father's empire. You ungrateful parasites, Maxwell spat as Marcus cuffed him. I gave you everything. No, Jasper's voice was quiet. You took everything. My father, my daughter, my soul. He turned to me. Mom, I know I don't deserve forgiveness. You're right. I watched Chin load Maxwell into a patrol car. You don't, Grammy? Ivy's small voice cut through the tension. Can we go home now? Home. Not the mansion Maxwell had bought them. Not the perfect facade they'd maintained. Home was my small house by the lake, where Robert and I had raised Jasper, where Ivy had learned to walk. Your father has some explaining to do first, Marcus said, his tone professional despite everything. About Robert's murder, the company fraud, all of it. Jasper nodded, broken but somehow lighter. I'll tell you everything. And then, Delilah asked, still holding Ivy's hand. Then we rebuild. I said, taking Finn from Chen. Not the lies or the pretense. Something real. As police lights painted the night red and blue, I held my grandson close, watching my son being led away in handcuffs. Justice had come at a terrible price, one generation's sins cascading into the next. Mom, Jasper called back. The night Dad died. He said something. He said you were right about Maxwell all along. That's why he was coming to tell you about the accounts. The last piece clicked into place. Robert had been driving to my house that night, choosing truth over money, family over facade. Like father, like son, just too late to prevent the damage. Ivy tugged my sleeve. Grammy, I'm tired. Me too, sweetheart. I gathered my grandchildren close, feeling the weight of victory and loss. Let's go home. Behind us, Maxwell's empire crumbled into handcuffs and evidence bags, while ahead, the long road of healing beckoned. Six months later, I sat on my lakeside porch, watching Ivy teach Finn to blow bubbles. The autumn leaves painted the water gold and crimson, like nature's way of turning the page. The newspaper on my lap carried Maxwell Monroe's sentencing, 25 years for Robert's murder, fraud, and attempted murder of Ivy. His empire had crumbled, taking down corrupt judges and officials with it. 
Officer Chun had been promoted for her role in the investigation. More bubbles, Grammy. Ivy called, her laughter carrying across the yard. The nightmares had mostly stopped now, though she still slept with her door open. Delilah appeared from inside, carrying coffee. She'd moved into the guest house after selling the mansion, using the money to start a foundation for children of domestic abuse. Jasper's hearing is tomorrow, she said quietly. I nodded. My son had pleaded guilty to lesser charges in exchange for his testimony against Maxwell. The prosecutor had recommended leniency, citing his eventual cooperation and the years of manipulation he'd endured. Will you go? Delilah asked. I don't know. I watched Finn wobble on unsteady legs, reaching for his sister's bubbles. Sometimes forgiveness feels like betrayal. Mom? Jasper's voice startled me. He stood at the garden gate, thinner than I remembered, wearing an ankle monitor. Part of his pre-sentencing arrangement. The restraining order, I started, is still in effect, I know. He stayed outside the gate. I just, I found something in dad's old files. Something you should have. He placed an envelope on the fence post. Delilah retrieved it, her hands trembling slightly as she passed it to me. Inside was a letter, dated the day Robert died. My husband's familiar handwriting filled the page. Vi, you were right about Maxwell. About everything. I'm coming home to tell you the truth. To make things right. To save our son from what he's becoming. He never made it home, Jasper said softly. Because I told Maxwell he was coming. Ivy looked up at her father's voice. For a moment, she seemed torn between running to him and staying with Finn. She chose her brother, wrapping protective arms around him. I don't expect forgiveness, Jasper continued. But they deserve to know their father tried to do the right thing, in the end, like you did. The autumn wind stirred Robert's letter. I thought of all the choices that had led us here, the ones made from fear, from love, from desperate need for approval. Grammy, Ivy called again. Finn's getting sleepy. Go, I told Jasper. The hearing's tomorrow. Well, we'll see. He nodded, understanding the weight of those words. As he turned to leave, Ivy suddenly ran to the gate. Daddy. Her small voice carried years of questions. Did you love us? Even when you were scared? Jasper knelt, keeping his distance but meeting her eyes. Every second. I just forgot how to show it. Like Grandpa forgot sometimes? No, sweetheart. Grandpa remembered. That's why he was coming home. I gathered Finn from the grass, feeling Robert's presence in the way the baby gripped my finger, in Ivy's quiet strength, in the painful hope of redemption. Time for naps, I announced, ending the moment before it could break us all. Later, as my grandchildren slept, I sat with Robert's letter and a photo album. The last picture of our family together showed Jasper holding newborn Ivy, his face full of possibility rather than ambition. Sometimes healing doesn't mean forgetting. Sometimes justice isn't about punishment. And sometimes, the hardest part of love is letting it change shape without letting it go completely. I placed Robert's letter in the album. Tomorrow would bring its own choices, its own chances for redemption. For now, the sound of my grandchildren's peaceful breathing was answer enough.